Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center. Today's session is part of our Mass General Heart Center's Heartfelt Dreams Foundation Expanding the Medical World webinar series. Before we get started, I just want to go a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you are in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for them in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speaker will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If it's a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'll be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next, I am going to introduce you all to today's guest speaker. Joining us today, we have Dr. Amy Bott. Dr. Bott is a clinical cardiologist, investigator, and educator at Mass General. She is also the Chief Innovation Officer at the American College of Cardiology, as well as an Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Bott most recently served as the Director of Outpatient and Telecardiology at the Mass General Heart Center. Her interest in digital health strategy and the digital transformation of the cardiovascular field stems from her belief that state-of-the-art personalized care can be delivered to individuals in the community, empowering patients and creating stronger doctor-patient partnerships for sustainable health outcomes. She joins us today to give a talk on mental health and congenital heart disease. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bott. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for taping this for later. I know how hard it is sometimes to get to something in the middle of the day. Um, so hello to those who are here um, and to those who may watch at a future time. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. And Amy, if you can just confirm for me that you can see it okay. Great. And I'm gonna hide this little floating panel so I can see my screen. Excellent. Um, so today I really wanted to focus on talking about mental health. Um, what we'll do is we'll spend about um, 25 minutes uh, talking and then we'll leave about 20 minutes for discussion, happy to take questions. Um, and you'll notice that the title today is Mental Health in the ACHD Patient and Clinician, um, because I think that's um, really important about our community and how we interact with one another. Just make sure I can forward slides. So um, Dr. Anitha John uh, put this together in a statement for the American Heart Association. It was actually focused on transition. You know, we've often talked about, and I've talked about in these sessions before, the challenge of what does it mean to transition from uh, being a congenital heart disease patient to an adult congenital heart disease patient, right? How do we go from pediatrics through the teen years into young and then older adulthood in the healthcare system? But I thought I would start with it today because I think many of the mental health issues that we are facing stem from the same challenges uh, and the same social determinants of health that lead to poor transition. So let's just take a moment to go through those. We'll start at the very top with environment in the red. So many CHD survivors and you who are watching, maybe one of them, live remote from heart centers. You don't necessarily live near one of the major centers that does quaternary care. Um, it is challenging to navigate the medical system. I myself have trouble as a patient sometimes navigating the medical system. We have not made it easy for our patients. And we oftentimes need appropriate transfer to an ACHD accredited center. Now this was said from pediatric to adult, but what I will say is if you're an adult who lives in the community where there's not an ACHD center, you may have a general cardiologist who has taken an interest in you, taking care of you, but doesn't do this necessary for a living. There may be times where you need to then go back and forth to the ACHD center that they have hopefully identified as part of your care team. Um, and so these are all challenges that we need to just think about in the environment in terms of even just getting the right care, right? So, so that already sets us up for some challenges. The second is the actual health care. We want trained um, physicians and nurses. We want lifelong care, but we have to deal with repeat procedures sometimes. And there's a little bit of like 
when will the other shoe drop that sometimes happens, right? Which is, I know that there may be a future time. So you're always looking a little bit over your shoulder. How do we allow ourselves to live life without that? Just knowing that there may be something else, but not letting it control us, right? And so another area of mental health. Um, insurance challenges, when we do not have insurance and we're figuring out how do we get COBRA, how are we getting in between two insurances, can be a real stress on our system. Um, social and community context. Uh, this is true for everybody when it comes to behavioral health. The people you have around you, the village, if you move and you are now alone, if you are the only one with congenital heart disease in your group and people don't fully understand, although they want to, then how do you find mental health support? We know that mental health practitioners are really challenged with many more patients who need to see them uh, than they have time for. And we go over to education. Um, it used to be true that CHD survivors were less likely to obtain um, a college degree. Um, it used to be true that there were more learning disabilities. We've done a great job with addressing learning disabilities across the board. Um, we've also done a really good job in terms of promoting education as individuals with congenital heart disease have grown into adulthood. So really proud of that. Um, and then economic stability. We require time off for medical care. Does that stress us and how do we address it? So what do we know? Um, I put this picture of Adrienne Kovacs. She's one of our colleagues in congenital heart disease and, and it's taught me a lot about what I know about psychology and ACHD. Um, and in fact, even psychology and being a clinician, which we'll get to. Um, I'm an adults with CHD who present as psychologist, anxiety, either generalized or somewhat focused on heart or cardiac issues, is a more common presenting concern than depression. So depression does exist. We'll look at the numbers. Anxiety is one of the most common presenters. This is true not only for the patient, but also oftentimes for their family members. Among surveyed adults with congenital heart disease, Elevated symptoms of anxiety, more common than elevated symptoms of depression. And there were two papers, 2016, 2019, that kind of both said that. If we actually look at the prevalence of mental health disorders in adult congenital heart disease versus the general population, this was done in Germany. So this is not just limited to the US. This is an issue we face globally. Um, you don't have to look specifically at the numbers. What I will tell you is for any of the different diagnoses that are there, ranging from anxiety to bipolar, panic, post-traumatic stress, the first column shows you the adult congenital heart disease percentages. The second is the matched percentage in the general population. And you'll notice that many of the numbers are higher in the ACHD group than in the general population. Now, this is all, mind you, 2016, pre-COVID. The rates in the general population have, in fact, risen. We're still reassessing the rates in the ACHD population. Um, an interesting thing that has come up, and I have told my patients along the way, is we have been dealing with health-related anxiety for far longer than the general population has. So actually, we have a lot that we can teach them about how we are coping, um, because the rest of the population is somewhat catching up to where we were before. So why does it matter? Obviously, it matters because anxiety, depression, and other disorders um, are worrisome. But what else do we see? We see that if you're an adult with congenital heart disease and you have anxiety or depression, you may have more primary care and hospital visits. You may end up using the emergency room more. You may end up spending more of your life in the hospital. And then from the system side, right? Why should people invest in thinking about our mental health, right? Why should there be more clinicians, more dollars put towards supporting us? Because there's more high resource use hospitalizations. There's an increased mortality risk. It is not only bad for our patients, but it's actually bad for the system. It's important for us to make these kind of arguments because we recognize that we need more money invested, more training invested in ensuring that you have the right number of clinicians able to help us deal with mental health issues because we don't wanna wait in line for that long when the pressing issues are happening now. So what are the numbers? Um, if you look at the orange or the top line of these bar graphs on each section, uh, that is anxiety. If you look at the second line, that is depression. Um, and we'll see from all of these different studies done by different authors at different times, we can see there's a slight difference, but generally, again, more anxiety, the orange, than the depression in the blue. 
and significant rates of both. So all of these bars, a majority of these bars are hitting over 20%, a one in five chance that you have anxiety or depression if you have congenital heart disease. So really it is a, a prevalent disease that we should be addressing in every clinic visit. Um, one question that I often ask when I'm in front of a larger crowd of people is how many people actually have clinicians who take the time to ask them about depression and anxiety? How many people, when they go into the doctor's office, get a screening test for depression or anxiety? It turns out that if you look at children now, teenage children should all be screened with a very short questionnaire about anxiety at their annual visit. The American Pediatric Association really insists on that. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to turn this around a little bit um, because there's clearly a problem. And I think COVID has changed things. Um, and I really think that you, the patients, we as patients, um, are the key to improving how we address mental health and well-being in adult congenital heart disease. I think the movement is going to need to come from the power of our patients, helping our clinicians understand how to fit this along with all the other things that we're talking about, whether in a clinic visit, over a remote visit, right? Maybe a telemedicine visit, over the phone, or even asynchronously, which means sending a questionnaire out, getting a response, having somebody respond back and communicate. There are so many different ways now that we can communicate between a clinical team, patients and their family and loved ones at home, that we really need to be using all of those different mechanisms to address all the different issues. It is true, it is challenging in one clinic visit sitting together to address a valve disease or an arrhythmia or whatever else is going on or an upcoming um, issue or procedure and address mental health. But it is the most important thing to address how we are thinking about all of those things because that is what affects our quality of life more than anything else. And I learned that from Adrian Kovac. So how can we do that? So the first thing I will say is, and I'm gonna kind of go out on a limb here, when we think about mind, body, mental health, behavioral health, there's a lot of emphasis on, well, you know, people can try yoga, they can try calm breathing. And I think we have to remind our clinicians where patients with congenital heart disease lie, right? Um, for some, yes, that sounds great, yoga, breathing issues, et cetera. For others who may be living with heart failure, living with valve disease, breathing actually is one of the things that worries us the most. So it turns out that the inability to take a deep breath, that feeling, is one of the primary complaints that we see from our patients. That can actually be a symptom of anxiety as much as that can be a symptom of cardiovascular disease, that trouble breathing. So really talking about breathing, defining what it's like, and helping your clinicians take the time to understand how you are feeling when you are having breath issues is really important. Now, second, really important to learn ourselves, how do we actually take a deep breath when we can, when we are not ill, when we are stable? How do we learn very short breathing techniques to help us calm down and center ourselves before we engage in something challenging? And I will tell you, it may not feel like it, but a clinician-patient encounter is challenging. I am best friends with many of my patients, but they will therefore tell me because they're comfortable with me. I get nervous the day before I have to see you every year because what if there's something I don't know? Now, the truth is we communicate enough that if there were something coming, they would know long before a clinic visit. I would not surprise them. But still, despite that knowledge, there is that feeling, right? What did we start doing about four years ago? Lauren McLaughlin, one of our nurses in the MGH Heart Center, started us out at the Waltham uh, Clinic. I don't know if anyone at the Heart Center has ever been to the Waltham Clinic. Beautiful place. A little more peaceful than being at Yaki in the big house, right? Fewer rooms, overlooks a highway and some hills, um, slower pace. And so we decided to move patients out there when we were going to do a wellness, behavioral health, mental health visit, and not necessarily talk about all the issues of what's happening with the valve, what's happening with the arrhythmia. And so we started this wellness clinic out at Waltham. And what we started to do was actually do a little bit of mindfulness at the beginning of those visits. Um, we would do 90 seconds. It turns out you can do as little as 30 seconds, but important for all the people involved in the visit, whether it's your clinical team, yourself or family members who may come in the room, to take 30 seconds to just level set a little bit, to calm down before we start that visit. Because what happens? 
the clinician is running in from the other room that they were just in. By the way, they may be answered two pages. You have just finally found a parking spot. You and your companion were yelling about, take this spot. No, that's too tight. Let's go over there. Or you took public transportation to come in and you were hustling with other people. Everybody's coming in in a very activated mode and we don't actually communicate as well or learn as well. The clinicians don't learn about you. You don't learn about what you need to for your heart as well if you're not in a slower mindset. And so the slow rather than fast mindset, we actually studied it. Um, Ada Stefanescu, one of our cardiologists um, at the Mass General Heart Center, um, who's an adult congenital specialist who also does the intervention. She actually studied this and published on it several years ago where we can really change from a fast to slow mindset. And when we do that in the clinic, then we're much better able to engage in that conversation. We just have a better visit. Um, we don't know yet whether that's true over remote monitoring. We think that it might be when you do televisits, but at the same time for a televisit, you're at home on your couch. It's a lot calmer way to start engaging with us. Um, and similarly, we as clinicians at least are in the office with the door closed in a calm, peaceful environment. So hopefully the need's not as much there. So breathing. If there are breathing issues, please take the time to explain what that is like. Take the time to understand the cardiovascular contribution. Take the time to recognize that anxiety can present like that as well. Understand how much of each component is there. If we're in a good place and we're talking about just regular things, um, still important to take 30 seconds, bring it all down together, and then engage. You'll have a better visit. You'll be better able to communicate with your clinician. They'll have a better visit with you. Um, teach body positivity. This is one thing I would love for us as patients to do with clinicians. Um, we don't think enough about body positivity. And it's really important because a majority of our patients may have surgical scars or interventional scars, um, may have syndromes, um, may have a slightly different hue or tone to their skin, depending on whether they're cyanotic. Um, and so there are a lot of body image issues that we know that we deal with in childhood in congenital heart disease. And the pediatricians and pediatric behavioral health is getting better at addressing you with everybody, not just those with chronic disease. However, in the adult clinic, thinking about body image is not one of the first things on most people's minds. You'll actually see it discussed um, rarely outside of the primary care, um, uh, primary care clinic visit. Rather than talking about body image and negative body image, the movement now is to really think about body positivity, how to be okay with your body, how to be positive about it, how to be kind to oneself, how to recognize that all bodies are good bodies, even when there's an upcoming valve procedure, even when there's an upcoming cat that needs to be done. And so really teaching about body positivity to your clinical team, I'm not sure that we're going to get there in terms of teaching it through the fellowship program, teaching it through, I would love if we did, I'm gonna try. Um, Doreen deferia Ye, uh, who is one of our adult congenital heart disease doctors here at Mass General, um, is also the fellowship director for the fellows. Little does she know, but I'm saying it to you first, um, that these are the kind of things that I'm gonna ask her if we can take some time uh, to teach the fellows and to think about, because it's really important. Um, but teach body positivity, learn and think about it yourself. You can Google it, not too many dangerous things I think come up when you Google this from my experience, um, but really important for us to recognize because it affects how we think about ourselves and it affects our tendency towards anxiety or depression. And so another way for us to address that and especially to address it in the office. I'm gonna turn uh, to clinicians for a second. Um, as you know, um, COVID was hard. Um, and it was hard on everybody. It was very hard on your team that took care of you. Um, they were doing the kind of care that the majority of them were not trained to do. They were seeing things um, that the majority of them you know, had not seen before. Um, and they felt very responsible because that's who we are, right? People who really feel responsible for those we care for. However, if you ask people about burnout, we have a problem with physician and nurse burnout. They are exhausted, right, from their work and how they're doing it. You asked them, did it begin before or after the start of the pandemic? 79% will say it started before. So we had an epidemic of clinician burnout before COVID. We simply added an additional 21% of people who got additionally burned out or burned out worse from COVID. So this was a problem even before. 
um, what do we see? We see about 42% of physicians burned out in this Medscape National Physician Burnout Report right before COVID. We see some what we call colloquially depressed, you know, so they kind of make some marks and they, and they are depressed. And then we see some that are clinically depressed. Those numbers have gone up. There's a new report that came out. And then you can ask which physicians experience both depression and burnout. And about the seventh one down in there is cardiology. That's about 13% of the group. Um, so you will see cardiologists that are experiencing depression and burnout. You may not recognize it, but if we go back to why do I ask you to take 30 seconds to just reset, calm down with your physician or your nurse, um, make sure that your guys are settled, is that they could probably use it as much as you can. Um, what happens with mental health in clinicians? So this is important. Um, we think about this in parenting a lot, right? How do you teach your kid to do something if you don't really believe in it, right? And so with something we kind of have to deal with, this is true for clinicians. We do need to help clinicians accept their own mental health reality. What we know is that when we do behavioral health teaching with uh, clinicians, we find that there are a few things that reduce their willingness to seek help, okay? One is the stigma of mental illness, which is increasingly going away. However, clinicians often fear the potential negative impact on training and career. They shouldn't, we're really changing how that's done, but it's something that's kind of ingrained in past years. Or beliefs such as I just need to be tough and deal. These are the kind of things that we see in the clinicians. And one very important thing is you have to help them understand that everybody can have behavioral health or mental health issues. Once they accept that, they're also more likely to be open to having those discussions with you and may in fact learn some things from how you deal with behavioral health issues, having had chronic disease since birth. And so really important, again, the power of the patients to help us bring mental health, behavioral health issues to light, but also to normalize the conversation in adult congenital heart disease, where it is a natural part of what we talk about in either one direction or both directions, depending on your clinical team's comfort level at each visit or in the appropriate visit, whether that's in person, over a video, doing anxiety or depression questionnaires online. But really important um, that we as patients push us as clinicians uh, to be able to think about this and do. Um, what is our solution to behavioral health moving forward? Um, yes, we have cognitive behavioral therapy um, and psychologists and psychiatrists who can help us, but they do have very long wait times. We should always be looking for them. We should always be in line. Ideally, your adult congenital heart disease practice, if you belong to one, should have a social worker and a psychologist or psychiatrist who they work closely with. If they don't, please ask them to make that happen. The second, yes, there are medications and medications are good when prescribed by a psychiatrist in collaboration with your cardiologist, knowing that they're safe for you, but necessary. Um, we support that. Number three, it's important for your family and your friends and those who support you to recognize these issues. Um, oftentimes they are dealing with it themselves. So in, engaging in that conversation is key as far as we're comfortable. And then the last and most important thing is when you come to your clinic visit, please help your clinicians take a moment and reset. They are in one of the worst places that they've been in a long time by and large, um, and therefore really helping them slow down a bit. When you see your doctor nurse running into the room, sitting down, typing on the computer, Help them bring it down for a bit, engage with them, and then restart that visit. Um, and, uh, and I think that's actually going to be a solution for their behavioral health as much as for uh, yours. So let me stop there uh, so that we have enough time for discussion. I'm happy to answer um, things about anything. Thank you so much, Dr. Bott. If you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. So we have a question in regard to in a post-pandemic world where telehealth is being used more, how has that affected people with congenital heart disease in terms of their mental health, as especially their ability to get care? Um, so that's a great question. The direct answer is coming. Um, we don't have large studies on it yet. What we do see is that the con adult congenital heart disease population has really good uptake of remote care. Um, and is one of the first who actually did remote monitoring. So many of us have 
pacemakers or other ways. There's also a really great uptake of wearables and other things like that, where remote engagement with your healthcare is happening and adult and child patients are, are really at the, at the front of that. Um, there are two ways to think about it. Uh, the first, what we're measuring is patient agency, patients knowing more about themselves, patients being willing to say, I need to be in the comfort of my own home, patients not having to call in sick for work or take time off and not be able to get paid, find childcare, somebody to cover them, get a ride. And so there are a lot of patients where the patient satisfaction with telemedicine in adult control heart disease has been through the roof. So people are really happy to be able to engage in their own lives in the studies, the limited studies that we have so far. The actual effect of that on the diagnoses of mental health, anxiety, depression, especially, um, I'm sure that Adrian Kovacs will soon have some work on it as will others. Um, and I hope that we're doing a better job, but I still think engaging in behavioral health with psychologists, with social workers is incredibly important. And I'll tell you just anecdotally, the majority of ACHD programs, um, our accreditation pushes for, you must have at least part-time social work, um, but we are still struggling with getting the funding for getting those kind of relationships up and running the same we have a relationship with cardiac surgery or arrhythmia, et cetera. And so it needs to be more a part of what we're doing. So don't have exact numbers um, on the top of my head to the percentages of anxiety and depression. There's also so many different factors, including COVID, the loneliness, the isolation, now coming out of it, the fear. Um, and so uh, I think it'll take us a little time to be able to separate all those and just say, does additional remote care make a difference? I think for the ACHD population is very willing and interested in having continuous care rather than episodic care. Not I see you once a year, but I'm in touch with my team multiple times a year because we've always done that, right? My patients have my cell phone number. Many of you probably have your doctor's cell phone number. We've always done that. So I think that continuous rather than episodic care, I hope will reflect positively on rates of anxiety and depression because we'll have more connectivity. Thank you. We have a comment in the chat. It appears that some congenital heart defects aren't diagnosed until adulthood. The diagnosis is a result of some other medical condition. Is there anything you'd like to comment on that? Yeah, um, it's actually a great point. Um, so congenital heart disease, although it is something you have had since you were born, no matter when it's diagnosed, in some people is picked up um, fetally, like in the tummy before you come out, right? In others, in the first few years of life, in others later childhood, but there are most certainly many adults who are diagnosed for the first time with a congenital heart disease in adulthood. Now, in some of those people, symptoms may not have been so significant that anyone was aware to look for it. Um, number two, uh, oftentimes the symptoms don't present for milder diseases until we get older and something else happens. Uh, and then sometimes we do just a lot more testing now. So if you go to an emergency department and something's happening, you get a CAT scan, we learn all sorts of things about your chest cavity that we didn't know before. And now all of a sudden, hey, incidentally, you have congenital heart disease. So yes, um, uh, there is still a large proportion of people who are diagnosed with congenital heart disease in adulthood. Um, some diagnoses that are not as severe in childhood may not show up as later. Um, we are increasingly really trying to ensure that the education of the cardiologists, of OBGYNs, of primary cares, is continuing at a rate that if it's a significant disease, you won't be missed. So we're hoping that the rates of severe diagnosis being diagnosed later in life it is pretty low. But things like valve disease, um, hole in the heart, sometimes genetic arrhythmias can be diagnosed later in life, even incidentally. So that's a great point. Thank you. You had made a comment about patients with congenital heart defects who often struggle with the transition from childhood to adulthood, how can we as family and caregivers be more supportive, particularly regarding their wellness? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is from a very young age, making sure that children know that part of their life and their team is having their pediatric cardiologist and then their adult congenital cardiologist, right? And I think we don't often include them in the conversation at a young age. Um, and so they just come because mom takes them um, or, or dad takes them or a guardian, right? And, and somebody's taking them there. They get to 18, they go to get a job or they go off to college and now we've lost them to follow up. It happens globally. The numbers actually globally are similar to in the US. Um, 
We also get busy during those years. And honestly, if someone's not dragging us there and we're told that maybe something could happen, do you wanna know? Cause life's going pretty well. And so there's some denial and that's through all chronic diseases. That's not limited to congenital heart disease. That's actually even in the general public. You ask the average 26 year old, do you see your primary care once a year to get your requisite testing? The answer is not yes, as often as we'd like it to be. Um, so as family members and loved ones, I would normalize. I think there's a lot about just normalizing. Yep, you see them, you see them once a year, then you're gonna get an adult congenital specialist who knows about this, you're gonna see them once a year. What you can do to help, um, achaheart.org, um, is a, a national group that supports adults with congenital heart disease. A C H A heart as one word. Dot org. They actually have a map of the United States and all the different centers that provide adult congenital care. One of the most frustrating things your loved one or friend with congenital heart disease may face is when they go to adult cardiology, the local adult cardiologist does not understand their disease, and that can be really disappointing. And so helping them recognize where the closest ACHD center is, is very important. So achaheart.org, find the closest center. Really nice to have a local cardiologist who knows you if they're willing to care with you and partner with the ACHD doctor that lives 300 miles away, right? I'm a big fan of having somebody local who knows you and then having your ACHD doctor. And now that we have remote care, um, it actually makes it a lot easier. You can stay in touch with that ACHD team in all sorts of different ways that involve monitoring or phone visits or video visits. Um, and we can also help you with connectivity if you have issues with that. So please don't let that be a barrier. So um, I'd say normalize it, tell kids at a young age, you know, lifelong cardiologist, right? And that's just part of it. It's not good or bad, it's just the thing. Um, and then, uh, and then really uh, helping people find doctors who understand what they have, because that can be a major disappointment and can lead to people not wanting to continue care. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts about support groups, both online and in-person as another way for patients and families to connect? Absolutely. So um, uh, there are many out there, if I'm not naming it, it doesn't mean it's not good. Um, Adult Congenital Heart Association is the one that I was just talking about. Um, uh, the It's My Heart organization, It's My Heart, um, also does a beautiful job and they're pretty active here in Massachusetts. Um, so I would look them up. Um, everybody is very willing to have new people join. Also, please never be worried. Oh, I don't know any of these people. I mean, you'll be their best friend within a week. They're just really the nicest groups. Um, there's amended hearts and amended little hearts um, as well. Uh, and they've been pretty active. Um, Others, I would most certainly look to the American Heart Association um, in your local area and express that you are a congenital heart disease patient, even though American Heart Association does everything. Um, we have a real group of people, both patients and clinicians, policy makers, right? These things are important to us um, who work on congenital heart disease issues. So please do look up your local American Heart Association. Um, I'm right now the president of the Boston American Heart Association. So please um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, or get in touch with our team if there's um, more people you want to meet. We've had quite a few patients from my practice who are ambassadors um, for the American Heart Association. And so that's a chance to actually be someone who helps others like you when they're going through tough times at the hospital, whether it's over the phone, in person, et cetera. Um, and so lots of different ways for people to interact. And then I do know that there are some social media groups. Um, I, I don't have any specifically that I would name. I think you have to be a little bit careful. Um, sometimes when there are groups that are not well regulated, people can spend time there because they are frustrated. And depending on your natural reaction, we're talking about mental health today, going to a place where lots of people tell really bad stories, like for me is not good. Um, I tried to watch a vampire movie before bed last night. That was like a bad idea. So we make bad choices sometimes, but, um, but I would just say, you know, get to know different groups. If it feels like a good fit, great. Um, if it doesn't, that's okay too. You may have to shop around till you find, you know, the group that feels good to you. But American Heart Association, Adult Congenital Heart Association, It's My Heart um, are three of the ones that I've worked directly with um, and really have great support, um, great respect for and do support. But the others are all excellent too. So I don't want to leave anybody out if I haven't mentioned their name. Um, at the American College of Cardiology, which is where I do innovation work now, um, there is a, a Cardio Smart. 
um, app and website. It tells you a lot about basic heart diseases in a way with kind of pictographs and other things that make sense. Um, so when you're looking for information, I would say the ACC is a great place to go. And if you don't see information there that you wish we had, please also let me know and we can make that happen. Thank you. Um, can I say a thank you to Heartfelt Dreams? Uh, is that okay? Of so, course. So Heartfelt Dreams is the nonprofit uh, that has supported uh, today's uh, webinar and, and similar others. Um, it's run by Eric and Lori Ankerud, uh, a family affected by um, congenital heart disease, now adult congenital heart disease. Um, and they have really done a great job of creating an environment of people who can support one another. Um, so the information to Heartfelt Dreams will be provided, I'm certain. But again, heartfelt with a T dreams. Um, the, uh, one of the key things that they've also been able to do is support people when they need to get places for visits. So if you need transportation help, you need overnight stay help. Um, if you just need to figure out like, where's the right place for me to go next? I'm feeling a little lost. Heartfelt dreams is absolutely the way to go. Um, really generous people just giving of their um, time and finances uh, to be able to bring people together. So that's a really important support group um, here based out of Mass General Hospital um, and the Boston area where you can find other families, but you can also just find somewhere where you say, I don't know exactly who to ask, but I have a question. Heartfelt dreams. Thank you. Absolutely. Can you share a little bit more about what mental health resources and programs are available at Mass General to help support patients with congenital heart disease? Absolutely. So um, through Mass General, uh, the Mass General psychiatry practice here actually um, is one of the most well known in the world. They're excellent. They span pediatric, um, adolescent, and adult. Um, they do inpatient as well as outpatient. They do remote as well as in person. Um, and so really important to ask us for a referral to the psychiatry group. We can do diagnosis and go from there. If you would like to do a wellness visit with the adult congenital heart disease program, uh, Lauren McLaughlin is the nurse in charge of uh, that program um, and can help put that together for you. That can be done virtually as well. Um, we have booklets that go along with that that talk about healthy living in general. So when we're talking about health and wellness, we won't just talk about mental health. We're actually going to make you think about your diet and nutrition, about physical activity or exercise as much as you can do, um, as well as kind of mental health. And so we'll address all of those things because I think it's really important for us to do that. Um, and you can do that through uh, the 617-726-8510 main number for the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Program here at Mass General Hospital. Um, other things that are really important to know is the Benson Henry Mind Body Institute is located with Mass General. Um, and they are a phenomenal institute. Uh, they focus a lot on both taking care of patients um, who have behavioral health issues, but also um, increasing awareness of diagnosis, of how to treat, of how communities can approach behavioral health together. Um, and uh, they actually uh, led the trial that we did at Mass General um, in thinking about how can we be resilient? So the course is called a SMART RP3 course. But what you have to remember is it's really a resiliency course. How can we teach and experience resiliency such that when things happen, we can keep coming back? And, and we took the course as well. Um, actually, Dr. Uh, Chris Learn is the head of the ACHD program now and, and followed me. Um, and I both took the course ourselves to get a sense of what do you learn in this eight week course? And I have to tell you, it was helpful for parenting. It was helpful for you know all sorts of different things in addition to thinking about your health. Uh, but resiliency is such an important topic, and it, it, it turns out it can be taught. So the study that we did actually was enrolling patients in uh, a virtual resiliency program. It was like this on Zoom with eight people and a leader um, who's a psychiatrist uh, at MGH. And uh, Christina Luberto is her name, if you want to look her up. She's beautiful research um, and really cares about the patients she takes care of. Many ended up actually seeing her afterwards in her practice. And... Um, I think she's really been invested in helping the adult congenital heart disease program grow. Um, there's several others as well uh, throughout the Benson Henry Mind Body Institute who have expressed interest in thinking about chronic disease. Um, they work with the rheumatology groups, they're working with um, other cardiovascular groups. And so um, there is not a better place to be to really think about behavioral health. But again, just ask. Um, you can call our main number and ask. Uh, you can ask Heartfelt Dreams, they'll get you in touch with the right people as well. 
um, but there are lots of different ways. And sometimes what you wanna find is the right flavor for you. One thing might work, something else might not. Um, and again, that's okay. We just have to find the right fit to um, help support behavioral health and all. Thank you so much. I believe that's all the questions that we have. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share with the audience before we end today's session? Um, I think I'll just kind of end with, we do a great job now in adult congenital heart disease. Patients have been really proactive um, about their own care. Families have been supportive and we have really great teams. Now, you know, when I first started practicing, um, the way you trained was you followed around the guy who did it before you, right? We didn't even have a fellowship program. Like this is how we kind of did things. And we have fellowship programs, we have training, everybody learns how to do it. We have team-based care. We have remote care now as well. We address health and wellness. So we've come a long way. I hope you see from me and, and hopefully from the way I speak with you today, I think the relationship and partnership between the patients and the clinicians is the next step for us. I think we have to be willing to really for the mental health and behavioral health challenges to be addressed, be willing to be human with one another in the visits um, and to really change that caliber and tone of the conversation to one of not paternalism or maternalism between a clinical team and a patient, but really an equal partnership back and forth. Um, and I do think that that not only helps our patients, um, but I think you will help your clinicians as well. So um, I, I hope that's conveyed by our tone today and our discussion. And again, please feel free to reach out um, to any of us at any time. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob, for the wealth of information and the resources that you shared today. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you.